Hello, welcome to the very first issue of Emerge, an EWF publication. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that while Emerge is a digital publication that is shared across cyberspace, it was conceptualised and created and shared from the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people. And to acknowledge the First Nations, first storytellers and traditional owners of these lands and the wider Kulin nations, and pay my deep respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to elders of all lands that you may access this publication from. Hello, my name is Ruby Rose Pivot Marsh and I'm the Artistic Director and Co-CEO of the Emerging Writers Festival. Welcome to the inaugural issue of our publication Emerge. Online is an especially unique and important space. It's often the first place writers are published and can engage with editors and audiences and indeed with other writers. It's also where a lot of communities are formed and people find connection. The digital space is something that excites Emerging Writers Festival and in our first ever edition of Emerge, we wanted to champion some of our favourite existing online publications. I want to stress that this collaboration and this list of publications is by no means ex exhaustive and we're often so inspired and invigorated by new work in the space, new work in cyberspace. We cannot wait to share with you this special first edition of Emerge and we hope you enjoy the brilliant works here and perhaps more than anything are inspired to read and create and engage further into the digital abyss. Please enjoy. I'd like to start by saying that this video was recorded on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to acknowledge that First Nations peoples and the first storytellers of this land and that their sovereignty has never been ceded. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the elders of the lands this video reaches, as well as the elders of all the lands on which these projects were made and in which they'll be received. Hi, I'm Pip. I'm the digital producer for the Emerging Writers Festival 2020. It goes without saying that this year has been an especially important year for digital publishing. The COVID-19 crisis hit the arts and literature industries like a tornado. Not only were more publishing activities well pulled into the online sphere, whether they will or no, but now even live arts activities like literary festivals had to make the jump to cyberspace. The shock to our system in the Emerging Writers Festival team was quickly replaced by excitement about being able to deliver new, exciting digital literary possibilities to people in their homes, especially in a time when arts events felt all too in peril, with artists receiving some of the stingiest COVID-19 welfare protections from the federal government. But EWF had the pleasure, indeed the honour, of being able to commission and pay emerging artists to write, speak and collaborate, and to bring together artists and audiences online, collectively, to share in creativity and community this year. As for publishers, it may have been a jarring shift for many. However, in the literature scene of so-called Melbourne and Australia, we were lucky to have an already thriving digital publishing scene. Many of our best and brightest publications we're already doing extensive and interesting things with online publishing. At EWF this year, we are so excited to be able to present five new pieces of digital literature with five amazing journals. Jed Press, Law Journal, Mascara Literary Review, Peril Magazine and Running Dog. Each of the journals chose an emerging creative writer and editor to work together to craft a digital piece. These collaborations combine to create Emerging Writers Festival brand new publication, Emerge. In its inaugural edition, Emerge considers collectivity. What does it mean to be an individual, really? We're all connected to other living and creating beings, from the writers we read, to our friends, our family, the birds singing outside our window, to collective forms of identity and resistance. Emerge asks the question, do we ever really write alone? Many of the pieces in Emerge consider the ambiguities or ambivalence in collectivity. From the way family history 
is embedded in an individual and in writing practice to mythic memory and the tensions of contemporary democracy, to the social relations embedded in place and the new gesture of the socially distant X, to the way lives lived in a single day are both individual and interconnected, to our collective ways of understanding sound and silence, meaning and interpretation. Collectivity is central to both writing and the digital sphere. Eleanor Savage writes, I read so much, I don't know where my ideas come from. A human being is not sufficiently evolved for the internet. But our collective and artistic voices are desperately trying to adapt to the polyphony of the digital world in all its ambiguities. They say technology is only as good or as bad as the way it's used. There was so much hope for the collective and collaboratory potential to cyberspace in its early years, especially including to digital literatures. Today, with Jeff Bezos becoming a trillionaire and Elon Musk colonizing space, it feels like we have all too, all too little collective power over the way technologies are made and used, especially for the most marginalized people. The call in the Cyborg Manifesto to rise up and take control, collective control of technology feels riper than ever. But in order to act collectively, or indeed in order to write, the question is crucial. What really is collectivity? What modes, assemblages, configurations does collectivity take? The artists in Emerge think through and tease out the threads of collectivity, from its deepest submerged roots in the psyche, all the way to its patterns in space, sound, and society. The processes that came together to make Emerge were themselves inherently collaborative. The way the writers, editors, and publications in Emerge have worked together has, I think at least, revived some of that spirit of the collaborative, collective potential of digital literature. I'd like to say it's been the hugest privilege to be part of the collaborative process with these amazing publications, writers, and editors for this project. When I started as the digital producer in March this year, I had no idea just how digital the festival was going to be in 2020. I was walking the dog a couple of weeks back and I ran into one of the EWF team, Alice. My brain could honestly barely believe that they were a real flesh and bone human being. But it's a testament to the commitment, excitement and inspiration of the EWF team, which I am so lucky to be part of, and of our outstanding artists, that the festival this year and its sense of community feels so real, even in cyberspace. Thank you. Now sit back and take in the techno literary treats of our artists in Emerge Collectivity. The first publication EWF collaborated with on Emerge is Jed Press. Jed Press is created on the lands of the Wandry people of the Kulin Nation. This land has always been and always will be Aboriginal land. Sovereignty has never been ceded. Jed Press is an online publication that exclusively works with and publishes people of colour. Jed's main purpose is to address the insufficient representation of marginalised peoples within the Australian literary landscape today. They are committed to increasing diversity and visibility especially in a time where racial tensions around migrants, people from refugee and asylum seeker backgrounds, Muslims and Indigenous Australian peoples are high, both here on home soil and overseas. They seek out, develop and present new works by people of colour with a special interest in those with intersecting identities. Jed Press believes that by having greater representation within Australian publishing, an industry that drives social standards, that they will collectively be able to better shape and drive the literary landscape. The editorial director of JED is Hella Ibrahim and the co-director is Rafif Ishmael. Hi. My name is Suzanne Garcia, and I'm an assistant editor at Jed Press. 
In Element, Alexander Tupohi reflects on the theme of collectivity in relation to family, memory, and intergenerational trauma. By exploring the bonds between people that connect us together through love and pain, through violence and history, through water, air, fire and earth, he shows us that we never really live, suffer, or even write alone. Water. Three figures of my nightmares rise from the ocean of my mind. Human shapes, waist deep in waves. The ghosts open their mouths like fish. Sound does not issue forth. With each gasp, water pours out. They waver as water crashes through them. It tumbles onto the beach, carrying their rubbish to my feet. I don't move. The three men stare at my figure on the shore. I stare back, willing them to make a move. They only sway back forth with each push pull of the sea. Waiting, 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 for what? Air. It is locked away, carried in a pelican's mouth, left to float in the starlight. The clouds hold many secrets. There is nothing to say, nothing to say. We are fine. Everything is. Help me. Everything. The key is to smile. A simple twitch of the mouth. On a windy day, I hear echoes of my secrets. The crack of a belt. A child's cry. My own words whoosh past me. I cannot quite get the words to leave my mouth. An apology would imply a wrongdoing. I am a good person. I am. They all say I am. It is a cycle. Birds are released from me. They become clouds. Everything is fine until it isn't. Another bird takes flight. Fire. The hands that held burn to, I find red fingertips on myself daily. Your fiery touch burned generations. A kind of fucked up legacy, a lightning strike burning them and me. The embers of your rage are forever alight. Earth. My land holds memories. They mingle in the soil with the worms. Sometimes I press my ear to the dirt to hear them speak. They console me as I cry, telling me they will carry my hurt for a little while if I wish. I stay there for hours to listen. They comfort me, telling me they believe me. The hurt I feel is valid. My land holds memories. Generations have passed over it. No one is forgotten. No joy or hurt unrecorded. All is remembered. That is enough. The second publication that Emerging Writers Festival collaborated with for Emerge is Law Journal. Law is a non Melbourne based literary journal. Law prioritises content by women and gender diverse contributors. It celebrates collaboration and community, both on and offline, by holding regular readings and events. They acknowledge that the majority of Law's content is created on stolen land and sovereignty was never ceded. Law's editors and founders are Mia Francesca McCuslin and Romy Durant. Tonight, I'll be reading Mia Francesca McCuslin's Introduction to Crumble. 
Digital platforms are integral to the modern publishing industry. Where print publications are restricted by cost and distribution, digital platforms allow writers and artists to share their work with a global audience in an instant, and for audiences to discover new and unusual voices. Digital journals will publish work that may be too experimental for traditional print publications, work that slips around and slides off the page. They've become an essential tool for writers both emerging and established, and bridge invisible gaps in the industry towards publication. The digital space is living, continuously evolving, responding and redefining itself. To think about collectivity in the digital space, I think first of the physical act of assembling, collaging, cut and paste. In Rima Martin's beautiful piece Crumble, collecting flora, twigs, rubble. Words, hope, a following. As creators of digital platforms, we also assemble, making virtual arrangements of myriad voices, perspectives and experiences. Collated on the digital landing, these stories link together and form a cohort of writers and create a space that encourages us to speak back, to question one another and to learn from one another. And to experiment, discover and collaborate, traversing time zones, oceans and imaginary borders. Now we'll hear from Rima Martins as she reads from her piece, Crumble. Genesis, Edda Mananke. Her villagers journeyed from the east to the western greens. They said to one another, let us collect bush sticks and clay and they found twigs for stacking and mud for flaming. Catch if you can, the moment the villagers begun to build, in the plateau, jealous of the widespread birds. They asked her, what are our arms for, if not for soaring? Arrogance of flesh, forgot what it is to run, what it is to die for land. They whispered as she slept, we will take you to the clouds of heaven. Shared stories are the enemy of deception. The Barostia people tell tales of men who used masks to reach their creator Niambi, who had fled to heaven on a spider web. Like Babel, the masks came down. What does our God fear? The villagers looked up from the long shadows, days spent in the dark and dust, to where the sun hit at the height of their production. When they had dug the earth of all its clay, they swapped the cake mix for flames and counted the sticks laid. Sweat, judgment of the villagers who worked and the anointment of those who thirst. Frenzied construction, stirring temptation, impatient hands, directionless fury. The cocaine high of progress, just ask the children of the industrial revolution or an influencer post bikini shot quicker now, for the glamour of a panorama. All this mystical hoo-ha, a tower to add to a deck. It was the children of the villagers that wrote that tarot card, the story of what precedes death in the major arcana. The beginning is the fool, and the ending is the world. The midnight mystics moan at the moon as they morph their bodies into a cobra, and tell of the chaos that such a card unveils. The demolition of falsities, and blows that reveal the dryness of the bricks you have laid. The purple slush boils and the nostrils of the woman flare across her blue cheeks leaking tornadoes. She cries creaks for the villagers, their mud cakes, the ripped roots and hollowed soil. How staunch is the empire? Will it stand against a compounding deficit? Will it fall to a world warming by four degrees, burning eucalypts, cities hidden in smoke? Will it bleed at every leadership spill, every coward handshake, every failure of democracy? To see your work undone is one thing, though towers do not simply fade. Spectacular hopes have spectacular falls, and what about the infiniteness of the horizon? Reimagine with the rubble and give thanks for the fall. The third journal that Emerging Writers Festival collaborated with for Emerge is Mascara Literary Review. Mascara Literary Review is a biannual literary journal co-founded in 2007. 
Mascara is particularly interested in the work of contemporary migrant, Asian, Australian, and Aboriginal writers. They specialize in publishing platforms for subaltern writing and human rights, focusing on cultural cohesion and participation. They foster a space for critical research and avant-garde writing beyond institutions that is progressive and vibrant. Mascara are interested in shaping the way that discourse structures, social realities, and positions individuals hierarchically. The word mascara entered the English language in 1890, but it derives from Spanish, Arabic, and French origins, its meaning evolving from the word mask, masquerade, to darken, to blacken. The Arabic word mascara means buffoon, suggesting violence and play in the correspondences between life and art. The managing editor of Mascara Literary Journal is Astrid DeMello. Now I'll read Joe Langdon's Introduction to Haunted Autumn by Danny Nethercliffe. At once vivid and spare in its delineation of a physical, material world, Haunted Autumn attends to both the tangible and elusive, or allusive, particulars of place, in ways that confirm the collective nature of a setting or site as invariable, invariably experiential. A temporal space, shaped by sensory experience, by encounters, by context. In accord with Michel de Soto's oft-cited line in The Practice of Everyday Life, that space is a practiced place, place becomes space here in the sense that it is never singular or fixed, but invariably collective, multiple and subjective, comprising various vantage points and complicated by contexts of the past, present. By a lines of striking observation and through deft negotiation of the digital page itself as space site, Nethercliffe's delicate yet incisive prose poem also calls attention to the often invisible labour, rendered evident in the past month months by questions about what work, whose labour, is essential during unprecedented times, and at what costs, physical and emotional, personal and collective. Notably, the del indelicate revelations this prose poem calls to our attention also remain in broader representations, largely obfuscated or overlooked. Most figures citing university sector job losses, to date or to come, have not included the loss of work anticipated by vast numbers of casual employees upon whose insecure labour these institutions have relied. Concurrently, international students upon whose fees universities have also depended have been mostly excluded from government support. Through these precise lines and luminous images, Nethercliffe shows with both clarity and nuance the university space as one of many sites in which the effects of the pandemic are felt unevenly even as student bodies remain, return, endure, haunting liminal junctures and uncertain futures. This is timely, compassionate writing that we are excited and grateful to publish. Now we'll hear from Danny Nethercliffe as she reads from her piece, Haunted Autumn. Haunted Autumn. X marks distance, we never used to know this. X was golden, treasure. X was illicit. X marked the spot. X was kiss, was marked wrong answers. One might rush then towards X before or take it as a lesson. With X we erase time before. Autumn leaves from the rows of ubiquitous blame trees drift and settle across university entry roads, piling deep in concrete gutters and banking in the unopened doorways of the gym. These leaves are as big as a large man's palm, outstretched. They have their own susurrations, whispered ephemeral languages, possessing no word translatable as absence. Spiderwebs have gathered, dew settled across the unopened hinges of the red mailbox outside the main entrance. It grows colder. All day, rows of buses arrive and leave, leave and arrive, empty. 
denuded of passengers, the bus stops of periods, punctuations. One morning a driver asks me when I disembark if I am okay going into the university. I assure him that it is still an inhabited place despite outward appearances. Another time, leaving, I walk from the library to the main building on a perfectly blue-skied day and a fine mist of water falls from the edges of the building, cloaked in motes of sunlight and the deep vibration of mysterious unseen machines. The revolving doors are stilled, marked unusable with narrow ribbons of red and white pandemic tape, delineating the scene of an unimaginable occurrence. Students sit apart with our exes, denoting distance, our unmasked breath, covenants of trust. We keep our distance. We acknowledge each other with looks, signalling a collective new body of knowledge. The university indelicately reveals its inner workings, an army of tradespeople, maintenance workers who maintain the neat green grass, the sanitization of tables, the cleaning of closed off spaces, puppeteers of vibrations, instrumentalists, rainmakers in miraculous spaces. Cabbage butterflies limb the autumn trees. Tiny yellow-breasted wrens, almost indistinguishable from butterflies, flutter up from green like feathered golden raindrops reverse flowing into coming winter. More students return, spaced by unseen exes. The trimester nears its end. We are here. The fourth magazine that Emerging Writers Festival collaborated with but Emerge is Peril Magazine. Peril Magazine is an online magazine focused on issues of Asian, Australian arts and culture. They have been sharing stories since 2006. Peril seeks to showcase new literature through diverse forms, including poetry, drama, translations, creative writing, memoir, essays, biographical profiles, interviews and other story structures. They are also interested in writing about the visual arts, theatre and film, and other cultural arts practices. Peril acknowledges that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the original owners and custodians of the land that we live and work on. Now I'll read Shari Duthi's Introduction to Trip Ditch by Ria Bagha. In my experience, digital publishing has been fairly straightforward. A written piece is edited and proofed, then published on a vertically scrolling page, sometimes with accompanying visuals. For Ria Bagat's triptych, we chose to shift the balance between written and visual elements in standard digital publishing by using a series of interactive images to present Ria's work. We kept the layout and interactive elements simple to pull focus between image and prose smoothly. We sourced the Creative Commons work of photographers and vector artists whose creations would underline the mood of the piece. The result is a collage of the collective work of 29 creatives, work that is generously available online for many other purposes, brought together here for Triptych, a series of vignettes that plunges readers into the connected worlds of three people in London, Rose, Samira and Ava. Unfortunately, Ria Bagat won't be able to read with us tonight, but instead I'll be reading some of their piece, Trip Ditch. Word had gotten around that Rose was not a friendly woman. She could sense the whispers as she slid her tray across the counter, piling up the compartments with beige foods, a wilted jacket potato, cauliflower cheese, a cup of custard. A ruffle of kale was the only concession to help. She said she stared down as she walked towards her table, noticing with a vague detachment that her crocs were flecked with blood. It reminded her of the Pollock exhibition Samira had dragged her to last summer, or the receptionist's screensaver, a pulsing red virus against a grey background. She claimed her solitary table near the open window. She scrolled Instagram as she speared her potato. She watched a soothing circuit of stories, 
Her favourite was a Pilates-sized woman doing a sped-up series of squats. She bounced up and down absurdly, her ponytail flailing. Her friends were at a music festival, so she saw shaky footage of the National from many different angles. She stared out of the window at the red brick psychiatric hospital. She could see a couple of cleaners smoking on the roof. She wondered what would happen if a patient jumped. She could picture the scene, voices amplified on megaphones, blaring sirens. Panic! Pandemonium! Samira stared at her cracked phone screen, endlessly composing a reply to his email. She hadn't thought about him in years, except in brief sensory bursts. During her punk phase, she shaved her head, and running her hands across her bare scalp, she recalled the smooth contours of his buzz cut, the way it felt like Velcro. She lay flat on the floor of the studio she shared with four other artists. She could hear the Polish family next door, the thump of saucepans, the crying baby, the smell of coffee through the exhaust. The studio was in a public housing block. The neighbourhood was up and coming, which meant all the darbars and Jewish bakeries were closing, replaced by stores that sold essential oils and impossible burgers. She wondered what it would be like to have a meaningful job like Rosa's, the squalor of changing catheters and bedpans. She was getting too old for this. The leftovers from cafe jobs, knock-off beers and tables made from upended crates. She was tired of this city, people waiting in lines for nothing. As a teenager, it felt so evocative and glamorous. Samira stared out onto the roof, covered in a crust of pigeon shit. She wondered if it was too late to sit the exams for law school, or match on shadi.com with some open-minded divorcee. Ava sat slumped on the toilet, leaning her head against the cubicle wall. She could hear the hiss of pipes, like the sound of the ocean through a conch shell. It was the solitary moment of self-reflection in her workday. This meditation was often cut short. She dreaded the sound of the creaking door, the snap of approaching footsteps. Etiquette demanded Ava quickly flushed and left. She had to uphold the collective pretense that no one ever took a shit. Ava worked in a sleek, shimmering office block. Her life was like an endlessly looping film reel, swiping her car through the metal gate, the whir of the coffee machine, the buzz of gossip. She would put on her headphones and work in small, intense bursts of concentration. She did her usual midday Pilates class, a room full of lithe women, slender muscled calves and rippling arms. The afternoon was busy and she listened to her meditation mix. Her boss's voice cut through Ava's concentration. Oh, she felt cagey, distracted, consumed by thoughts of Rose. She toyed with the idea of sending a passive-aggressive text, but it was too much effort. She stared out of the window. The apartment block opposite reflected the glare of afternoon sun, singeing her eyes with an orange glow. She imagined her pupils emitting a laser beam, cutting through the glass. She would carve an escape hatch, dripping with molten edges. She could feel the flutter of the breeze on that precipice. She would fall from the edge, weightless, swallowed up by the sky. The fifth and last online journal that Emerging Writers Festival collaborated with for Emerge is Running Dog. Running Dog is an online arts platform based in Sydney, Australia. They publish weekly articles about exhibitions and events taking place in Sydney and regional New South Wales. Running Dog believes in experimentation, playfulness and rigour in contemporary arts writing and seeks to privilege nuance and contemplation in debate. They're committed to covering the work of emerging and established artists through circulating regular content about artist-run spaces, collectives, commercial galleries, institutions, one-off events and festivals. Running Dog acknowledges the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land that facilitates the creation of their project. They pay their respects to their elders past and present and their descendants. Now I'll read Hannah Jenkins' Introduction to Unsound by June Tang. Unsound surfaces aspects of collectivity that occur in small gestures, 
and moments of isolation. Like plunging into a deep sound or a moment of silence within a surging crowd, June has created a space for clarity amidst incessant chatter and conflict. This is digital literature that celebrates slowness. Its elements of interactivity often rely on stillness and careful observation. I hope all who experience this piece discover the treasures it holds if they take the time to look and listen. Now we hear from June Tang as she reads from her piece, Unsound. Beside hearing, there is listening. Besides listening, or perhaps included within it, is what cannot only be orally absorbed, but must be seen or seen to, touched or moved, by or with, between and beyond what is beloved is believed. If listening does not lie deeper than hearing, but streams parallel to it, then it is neither river nor bank, but perhaps where the river has dried and a path of sand emerges broad enough to tread along. It takes seeing the river to later notice the sand and silt. It takes hearing the world in all forms passive and inert to come across the live nerve of listening before diffusing, diffusing back into hearing. Without performing a deeper dive, one simply shifts weight between feet, one to its other, one and back, one and again, until shift becomes sway in a dance that dithers, in the absence of logics, the absence of balance. Habituated, however, one maintains a habitat without risk. Nevertheless, can I who am not you, and you who are not I, take a walk through the city forest, between the frequencies of asphalt and the frequencies of feathers lies the vibrating spectrum of sound sleep and sound investment, sound advice for sound health, the sounding out slowly of scenarios and syllables, or quickly of alarms and gavels and voices pulled and plowed, sounding variously dry, desperate, tender. Through air or cable, Something is released, something is not always received. For ten years the skylark was studied, before it was understood, finally, that the meaning of its song did not depend on frequency, pitch or rhythm, but on silences. One can listen for silences, its many breeds. Silence of waiting, silence of rest, not speaking, not listening listening without speaking, though in a time of untruths or ventriloquizing truths, silence too becomes freighted, a roulette between resistance and acceptance. Fade in, fade out, tune in, tune out, opt in, opt out, turn against, turn around. Along network shores, a public wave crests before breaking. Out on wet sand, that deafening noise of the sea. Confronted with listening, one doesn't turn away. Thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you who tuned in on the night of the launch, you'll know we had some serious technical difficulties with streaming the videos. Technology really can be a friend or a foe. But I'd like to take the opportunity now to say that despite all of that, I, I was and am so honored to share the works of so many amazing creatives with the world for EWF this year. Hella Ibrahim from Jed Press, editor Suzanne Garcia, writer Alexander Tepoe, Editor Mia Francesca McCoslin at Law Journal. Writer Rima Martins. Astrid DeMello and Michelle at Mascara Literary Review. Editor Joe Langdon and writer Danny Nethercliffe. Mindy Gill, Eleanor Jackson and Alison Chan at Peril Magazine. Editor, editor Chari Duthi and writer Ria Bagat. 
Naomi Riddle at Running Dog, and editor Hannah Jenkins and writer June Tang. It was so incredibly fun and inspiring and enriching to work with you all. And don't forget, you can explore the pieces in full and in all their interactive glory by visiting the Emerge site. Bye!